are now assigned as labeled. The group outputs are the different types of instruments and singers. Um, the monitor outputs, these are your masters for the different monitor outputs. And then we've got a spare here on M9. M10 is the effects send. So I can send to the effects from everything that I've controlled uh, and dialed up on M10 here. This is my master. So I can essentially turn off the send to the effects. Um, so let's say after a song, you don't want to have echo while the worship leader is talking. So you're going to want to turn that down and then bring it back up when the next song starts. So that's a, a good knob to have kind of handy and uh, turn on, turn off between songs. There are tone controls on this board and they allow you to uh, change the tone of the reverb. Uh, the ones for the monitors could be used to tweak and I hate to say use it for feedback control. If there's feedback, there's probably something else wrong. But you can use these as tone controls if you need to uh, give it a little more low end, you can do that. There is a uh, button here as well on the tone. EQ on is down, up is off. I would probably suggest that these not be used unless you have to. Uh, anytime you start EQing stuff, you're adding more gain stages and amplifiers and preamps into the system, and it just gets more complicated. So uh, if you don't need to use it, don't. So that's what the green knobs do. Um, the uh, group outputs have a pan left, right, much like the channels. Same thing, probably going to stay in the 12 o'clock position, which is an equal sand to left and right. All right. Um, on the groups, I said here you want to be around zero. On your monitors, you're going to be around zero. On your effects sand, uh, probably around zero, but whatever, wherever it needs to be. And on your master section, around zero or wherever it needs to be. And this is really determined uh, how the gains are set on the DSP processor, the, the preamp EQ, and the amplifier settings. So I like to set systems up so that when this is at zero, the uh, system's about at your target SPL level. And that varies from fellowship to fellowship depending on what level they are used to or what they'll tolerate. Uh, some think 70 dB is too loud and some are perfectly happy in 110. So it just depends on, uh, I guess, if they're from the late part of the 60s to the first part of the 80s, they like it loud. And if they are before that, they usually like it a little bit less loud. So again, you just try and make as many people happy as you can with the, the settings. That's just a nice visual way to be able to get to it quick and set it and not have to kind of remember where this was minus 10 and this was minus 20. and and. Uh, just keep it visually flat all the way across. There are after fade listen buttons on the groups, and that is essentially what it says, is after this level, you have the ability through the headphones to listen to that group. And this is useful if you just want to listen to all the vocals, or you just want to listen to the drums all at the same time, or all the instruments all the same time as it's mixed into that group. And then you've got the groups going out to the house, and here's your after fade listen for the house. So now you can hear in your headphones essentially the mix and the level that's being sent to the processor and to the amps. So that's just another way of cueing in headphones what you should be hearing out front. And if you aren't hearing it out front, it could be the amps are turned off or the processor is on a bad preset or, or something has become unplugged. All right. We're going to move up to the uh, recording outputs and the effects return section up here. Uh, the effects, as you remember, go out 10 and they come back in on this AUX3 return. Um, this is also um, has the ability to put the reverb into the monitors, one, two, three, four. And, um, you know, that's a preference thing. If the worship team wants to hear a little bit of room sound, although it's not real, it's fake, it's done by a processor. But it sometimes helps to sing if you've got a little reverb and you're not just in a dry environment. Uh, so you can turn up monitor one, two, three, four. You don't want to turn up monitor 10, or if at some point we also have an additional effects device on nine, you don't want to turn the return up 
creating a loop from the output to the input. So whatever we're using here is an output 10 and 9, for example. You wouldn't want to feed back into itself 10 and 9, or you get a nasty feedback. The red knob is uh, master. That goes to the stereo uh, left and right, which is the master output to the house. There is a pre-fade listen, so you can hear the echo. And there's an on-off switch. So uh, there's two places, as I said. You want to turn the reverb off or the effects off between songs. And you certainly don't want to have them on, typically, when the teaching is going on or somebody's doing announcements. So there's a couple places to look. If you want to get rid of the reverb, you can do it here. Or you can actually um, turn the channel off. Essentially, you've got no input. This could even be up, and you'd still get nothing back into the monitors or the mains um, to uh, kill the, the reverb or the effects going into the system. So that's two things. And if you don't have reverb, those would be the two places to look. Is it turned on for the return? And is your sand actually sending out? All right, then we go to the record sand output. And after much talking and discussion and figuring out what plugs we have available on the back of this board without buying any additional equipment, but still making it easy to send a somewhat mixable, controllable signal to the uh, video recording to a computer for webcasting, to the DVD uh, recorder or CD recorder tape, is to come out of a matrix. And essentially what a matrix output allows you to do is take a source from uh, the different outputs of the board, the groups and the main output, and mix that as a separate mix to go to your recording devices. And the reason why you may want to have a separate mix, uh, the example would be in the room itself, where you've got acoustic drums and you've got uh, percussion and guitars, acoustic or with amplifiers. The likelihood is you're not going to turn some of that stuff up very loud in the main PA system. So what you're going to end up getting from that send going to a recording would be vocal heavy, typically not a lot of bass, not a lot of drums, mostly vocals maybe some of the lead instrument, because that might be on top of everything in the room even. But with the matrix output and using the groups, you can control the different vocal outputs, the instrument output, the drum output, as well as the stereo left-right output with a master control, an on-off switch, and yes, an after-fade listen. So you can see with headphones what you're actually sending to the recording devices. Um, we're in the same room that the sound system is in, so we don't have isolation. Putting on headphones allows you a little bit better uh, hearing of the actual mix without the, the room speakers or the sound of the room itself. So what you're sending to the recording should be somewhat balanced. I mean, if you're recording worship, you're going to want to hear some drums and bass and the instruments, and the vocals should be blended in there nicely. So that gives you the, the ability to have some control uh, but it's more convenient than having to actually mix all the channels by using one of these uh, auxiliary sends on each channel and then trying to remix that if something changes. So I think this is going to work out pretty neat. We'll find out how that does. And I have set up systems, you know, many different ways. This is certainly is very common to use a matrix out when it's available. Um, we have a separate matrix output for the record level and a separate matrix out for the video level. So typically these are going to be set the same um, and uh, you just copy one from the other. So if you do have to adjust something, you are going to have matrix one and matrix two to adjust. Uh, and then if there is a special need for the video people, which sometimes they do have, that you have the ability to give them a little bit different mix than what may be going on the CD. All right. We're getting down here to the last few things, and that would be the talkback module, which gives you a place to plug in a mic and talk back to either the monitors. And there's buttons on here that allow you to go monitor 1 through 4, 5 through 10, stereo, which would be the house speakers. There's a volume control, and there's an on-off switch. Um, and this is important, too, is if you do have a talkback mic laying back here, you're going to want to make sure and turn it off and not create another however it is from how far it is from the speakers back to your mic going through and creating echo and that sort of thing. So 
talk when you must and turn it off when you're not. Um, along with some controls that you probably won't be using just in this particular situation, there's a control room, um, uh, control room level uh, that is another output of the master level. Uh, actually, no, that's an output of the uh, headphone level that would be typically used if you had a studio set up and you wanted to pre-fade listen a particular channel or a group in your monitor speakers in the mixing room so that it, rather than wearing headphones now you can punch the control room monitor on and adjust the level here. It is going to be um, uh, getting its source from the PFLs so uh, that's not a good source to use as an additional recording output or um, something where you want to just get a general mix because as soon as somebody pushes a PFL it, it's, it mutes all the other channels except the one that you're listening to in the headphone. So that control mix, uh, CR Mani, is essentially the same as a headphone uh, output that you'd get with PFL. It just has a volume control to go to speakers. And then the headphone output is um, what you're going to have a volume control here with the ability to PFL and, and get the levels where you want them. And there's an on-off switch for that as well, too. So lots of buttons to push. Only one does one thing, so you just got to find the right one at the right time to push. All right, that's it for the general overview of mixing boards and now we're going to ask questions about I just what I just went over and see what we have to find out. Questions? Comments? I stumped them. Okay, we'll move on here to sound. All right, questions? They're speechless. It seems like it's going to be a little harder to Make sure that the tape or CD get the right thing. And it is up here in the matrix. Right. Usually and you just turn the level up and you have what you need it. Okay. Now, just because it's more complicated doesn't mean it has to be more complicated. Before you weren't using groups, you don't have to use groups. You can assign each channel to a stereo output, right? So now you're just going out left, right, like you always were. Up here, you can just use left, right, and it's exactly the way it was before. You don't have subgroups to mix your individual vocals and instruments and drums. Definitely want to use the system to the max. Well, it's, it's, you know, it's totally up to your particular needs and how it operates. Uh, if it's too complicated, that certainly doesn't work because it won't get used anyway. But just as long as you know that these buttons do something and if they're in the wrong position, I'm trying to give you a kind of an overview of how you can use it if you want to. And I've uh, wanted to set it up so that uh, if you're not doing this seven days a week and this isn't what you live and breathe for, then it works for you. The guys that have the experience are going to set it up the way they're going to want to run it anyway. So this is just labeled and uh, set up to give the flexibility that you may not have seen possible before. Uh, so, and we can go over that some more in depth too to make sure you capiche the signal flow. And that's really all we're talking about here. Stuff comes in, it gets out somehow. What all does it have to go through to get out the way you want it to? And that's really all that matters. How does the phone fit in? Do we still have? You still have a phone input here, phone, right here. The phone output is going to be just one of these matrix outs. Everything out of the board that goes to recording, that goes to um, the cafe or the pavilion out there, that's what I call a zone. And that's essentially what you want going out is just everything that's going out of the board. And this matrix stuff just gives you the ability to select um, if you're using the groups to be able to send a little bit different mix to make up for the lack of not being in the room and having that acoustic reinforcement here. Now the phone's a good point though in that you wouldn't need to have, uh, normally you're not going to want to pipe worship down the phone. So I mean that's an area where we could look at if there's another discrete output to go to the phone. Uh, previously that was on one of these. Well I just happen to have this one not used. Maybe that 
is what the phone could be used for. So right now it's up in the matrix? Right now, everything going out would be of a matrix out nature. Um, so it is wire, it's wired up though, right? The phone, <coughs> the phone is... Well, theoretically, yes. Okay. I don't remember. I wasn't never. I never was very much involved in using the phone before Stephen got the most experience on it. So mm -hmm. I don't remember how it was connected. And we should hook it up and try it just to make sure that we all know what it's supposed to do. And then, if we know it works, usually it's good to go. And then if it doesn't work, we can figure out did something get unplugged or mm -hmm. is a button not pushed. One thing I've uh, never really understood. It well as how to set up the effects, uh, you know, how to, what's the right way to set it up. Mm -hmm. well, if they don't like it that way, they want it a different way, how do you change it, those sorts of things. Okay, and I think what we'll do then is, after we get done with the board, we'll go down and look at the effects unit. Um, okay. Typically, um, the effects units that are put in have presets. Mm -hmm. So what I suggest doing is coming up with maybe five or six presets that you're familiar with. And it's a fast song, slow song, reggae song, echo for a echo effect, and then maybe a flanger or a phase shifter for those searing guitar solos that you want to throw something really f fabulous on, you know. But y you don't have to learn all 130 of them. There's some that are so subtle it would be hard to tell if you're in a 20 by 20 room or a 21 by 21 room. So if you get five or six effects that you're comfortable with and you learn what preset numbers they're on, we can put a little label on the effects unit and say reverb we usually use, or the reverb is if number one. Some you can even assign as user one, user two, user three, user four, and that's usually what I like to do is just um, make it as simple as possible so you don't have to scroll through all 200 or all 100 different possibilities. So if you have a speaker that normally speaks and you want a certain effect on his voice, right? you can just already have that preset. Right, right, and typically you wouldn't use an effect on a speaker. The room has kind of an effect all its own, um, and on the recordings you don't want to put an effect typically because once you've recorded an effect it's real hard to get rid of reverb or echo off of a recording. For teaching, for spoken word, you're going to want to keep it pretty much dry. Um, I mentioned a trick that I've used using a reverb and a gate on uh, rooms that have real high ambient noise in that the gate closes the microphone so you don't pick up the air conditioner or the screaming babies in the third row. But then the reverb synthesizes a bit of a room or a chamber sound just so it's not a, like they're in a fiberglass closet. So there's a little liveness to the back when they stop speaking but the mic is closed in reality and you're not picking up the room noise. But I mean, that's a technique more than how to run the board. Uh, you're going to want to use reverb on vocals to kind of fatten things up. Uh, chorus is nice on guitars. Chorus is nice on vocals too, as long as you don't get effects, you want to be careful not to make it like the center of attention. You know, you know this isn't like a 70s rock show, so we're not trying to do effects left or right panning and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it would be better to be subtle. And with that in mind, when you're doing the effects send or you're up here on the effects returns, you're going to want to kind of ease into it, even to the point where if it's off, you probably want to turn the levels down, unless you're absolutely sure they're where they should be, and then turn them on and bring up the level in the house, as, as well as the monitors. But uh, certainly in the house, you don't want to blast somebody with reverb out of nowhere. So uh, each channel has on 10, M10 is going to be the effect send for that channel. Um, probably flute, probably guitar, a little bit, probably vocals are your primary effects. Don't use too many effects on bass drum or bass guitar. That's usually pretty much just straight ahead. What about the keyboard? Depending on what they have up there, some keyboard players and some electronic uh, electric guitar players have their own effects. So you don't want to step on what they're doing. Even like the string ensemble uh, patch on the board, on the keyboard, or I mean, they have some built-in uh, sounds. Mm -hmm. When you play that, um, like even a grand piano, 
Yeah, that's not just a grand piano in a dead room. It sounds like a grand piano in kind of a, a hall or a, a, a bit of a room anyway. So when in doubt, use your ear. And if it sounds bad, turn it off. I mean, that's the best way to approach mixing is if it sounds good, then you could probably leave it alone. If it sounds terrible, then you probably should do something <laughs> to make it better or turn it down at least until you figure out what it is. Uh, but knowing what the knobs do, having them labeled at least is a starting spot to learn, try different things and not have everything change from week to week and uh, uh, be able to get a little more experience with what reverb sounds like or what the tone control and the sweep of the frequency sounds like. Uh, it is hard to tell sometimes when everything's going on and you probably don't want to experiment a whole lot while the pastor is teaching. You know, it's not good if everybody turns around and looks at you and they're supposed to be looking at him, <laughs> looking up, not wishing you would go away. So, um, you know, come in before or after or sometime when there isn't a service happening and play around either with a CD or get a mic and talk in it yourself and listen to the different reverbs and the different effects and get more familiar with it. So record goes to the cameras mm -hmm. and send goes to the tape deck and anything else. Mm -hmm. The two matrix outs we're going to set up to go as the record outs. So you still have a little bit of flexibility with the mix, but you're not having to do all 32 knobs. Goes to the computer is still, still a red knob down there. And it is ST2, yeah. And I probably want to change that. I'm probably going to want to come out of a matrix mix because okay. you're probably going to want to do worship when you do media encoding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're, want, you're going to want to get a mix so it's just not all vocals. So that one will be out of the send as well? Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts, comments? Before you go through all of, before you go into the next section, mm -hmm. if you had a guitarist and a vocalist, could you just quickly run through the process of how you would set it up? So, channel by channel, you have one instrument and one voice. And okay, well that's good. Um, when you're setting up system, either with a new wor worship personnel or a new drum set or a new guitar, you aren't going to just want to turn everything up to zero and then walk away. You're going to have to do some level adjustment, some EQing. So what Susan was asking, if I had a guitar and a vocalist, what would I do? So I'm going to go over to my guitar channel here. Acoustic guitar is a guitar. It's not a guitar, it's acoustic guitar. And as I started out, you're going to want to set the gain using the PFL. So you're going to say, okay, play a little bit. and I've gotten to the point now where I like to say, play a little bit, and I'm not going to have you in your monitors. We're just going to listen to the house first. And that gives them an opportunity then to get used to, A, not having very much monitor, which is a good thing, because if you do it the other way around, it's very easy to get the monitor so loud, you can't turn on the house. And that's not good, because then there's two or 300 people out here that are straining instead of one who you can get it to work, but you got to do it with the house first. So you're going to get your level in the house, um, get your gain set, work with your EQ so it's not too brittle or too bassy. Uh, you certainly don't want any feedback from a hollow body guitar, so you may want to play around with that. Or if they have a DI box that's adjustable tone-wise, to have them play with their tones. So they're happy with that, as far as they can tell out here. Then you're going to go and say, OK, I'm going to turn up your monitors now. And you bring up their monitors to where they, oh, yeah, I can hear that in the monitor now and it's not overpowering out here. Um, and then move on to your next one, vocalist. I, I tend to like to do uh, one at a time rather than try and mix 15 people all at once. It gets to be kind of hard to please that many people at one time and there's just too much going on. So um, if you have just a, a duo, guitar and a vocalist, get the guitar first because the vocalist is typically going to be easier. You're not going to be doing as much fine tuning on that. Uh, but then you'll move to the vocal, which is over here. And uh, whatever vocal mic they're plugged in, what channel they're plugged in, you go through the same thing, set their gain using the PFL. 
say, okay, is that as loud as you're going to sing? And they'll say yes, and then you turn it down a little bit more because they probably will say it, sing a little bit louder. So give yourself a little bit of headroom. Um, if you're only going to have two microphones or three or four microphones, it probably is not as uh, much of an advantage to go through the groups. And you always have the option of just assigning this vocal to stereo. So I can literally have these off, and I can have my volume for my vocal here and my volume for my guitar here. That's fine. Well, I mean, that works. It's kind of a stretch here between these two. So I could go back to my group scheme and assign these to my appropriate groups, and then I can have my vocal here and my instrument here. There's my two vocals. That's so just another way of looking at the, the routing capability. Just because I can do it this way doesn't mean I have to, even though I've only got two channels. I've got two fingers. I can usually do this easily, and I could even do this with my nose if I had to. But when you get into multiple drum mics and multiple guitars and multiple vocals, then this definitely is an advantage once you get the, the, the hang of it to be able to control your individual group levels. So to recap, you're going to set your gain on the channel. and unless you've got the same instrument, the same player, the same channel, you're probably going to want to just check that every time. Make sure that that level is right. Because if it's wrong and everybody starts playing, you're going to have to say, wait, stop, and then set it. 